Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our session this afternoon for our spring online school changing the identity of the radiographer i'm charlotte stevenson i'm a business development manager at the university um, and as a team it's our responsibility to provide a gateway to anybody looking for cpd opportunities across the university um, a few bits of housekeeping before we get going this afternoon and um, we've got the chat function available there if you want to talk to the team um, any sound problems any issues like that we've also got um, a couple of the members of Cardiff University's radiography team on the call so you pop any questions in there and if you've got any questions you want to ask for our speaker this afternoon Jonathan please pop them in there and we'll make sure there's a bit of time at the end to do a Q&A where we can ask him any questions that you've raised throughout the session. We're all working in different locations, so please bear with us if there's any interruptions, comedy talking on mute, noisy builders next door, etc. cetera. Um, that's enough from me. I'd like to hand over to Jonathan McConaughey this afternoon, who's gonna give us a talk. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, just get this screen sharing thing to work. And hopefully everybody can see that now as full screen. Uh, just a little introduction uh, from myself. Um, you were probably expecting a Scottish accent and instead you've got a Yorkshire one. Um, but that's because uh, I hail from Leeds originally uh, and have moved around the planet on various jobs over the years um, to follow up various clinical and academic positions and also to um, participate in a range of research and a range of different roles. Currently, uh, I'm consultant radiographer within NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which means I have a base at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, but my work is across the whole of the health board. I lead a team currently of nine reporting radiographers, which if everybody passes their exams later this year, will rise to 12 uh, with the view to providing a, a significant um, across the working week service. Uh, also at the moment, I'm working with Scottish Government on uh, several different projects about the role transformation of radiographers, but also the transformation of radiology services within Scotland. Uh, I spent some time working in the Antipodes in both New Zealand and Australia uh, and from Melbourne came back to the UK to Aberdeen so quite a temperature difference. Anyway today I'm here to talk about the advanced practitioner uh, and 
the identity of the radiographer and how it's hopefully going to change over the years as uh, our roles develop and move forward. So let's just start with a couple of definitions to begin with. If we can get this thing to turn over. There we go. So the College of Radiographers defined the advanced practitioner and the consultant practitioner, as you can see here on the slides. So the advanced practitioner is effectively a person that can make appropriate clinical decisions related to their enhanced level of practice directly impacting the patient care pathway. Whereas the consultant practitioner takes that a stage further in that we provide leadership uh, in relation to clinical practice and high quality patient focused services. We also help in developing new evidence to help other people go on and change their services over time. Um, and a consultant practitioner, and indeed an advanced practitioner, could actually be in areas outside clinical practice. It could be management, it could be research, it could be as uh, teachers. However, we're now at a point where the previous education and career framework definitions, which you saw on the earlier slide, are moving forwards and various uh, government bodies within different um, jurisdictions throughout the UK have been asking questions about should we change the definitions of people? Health Education England in particular have started this work and these, these slides that you're seeing at the moment are the definitions that we've come up with in Scotland about the varying layers and levels of working that you will see um, across the radiographic spectrum. So past your initial, initially qualified practitioner grade, you would move into a senior or perhaps a specialist role, equivalent perhaps to a band six. Um, and you can see in the highlighted area that that means these individuals will develop in-depth professional knowledge and skills in a particular specialist area, or perhaps deepen that professional knowledge in a and skills in a particular area. In other words, that slight difference between the specialist and the senior grades. And most definitely, it's not confined to just a very tight area of practice. It could be that you broaden your professional knowledge over a wide area of practice to, to move services forward. As you move on to the next level, which would be an advanced practitioner, and if you're thinking of this in terms of pay levels, that's somebody probably working at band seven, uh, but certainly like working at master's level. And that's the key thing here. It's the master's level um, type of working that you've got to demonstrate. So to be an advanced practitioner, you need to have at least some kind of master's level award, be it a postgraduate certificate or diploma, ideally having completed your full master's degree. That encompasses the four pillars of practice, which I think many people working in healthcare will be familiar with now of clinical practice leadership, management, education and research. So this requires you to demonstrate core and area specific capabilities relevant to your scope of practice and your role. And it gives you lots more autonomy. It gives you the ability to make decisions independently. And it means that you should be able to analyze complex problems in a range of contexts and settings and bring new information together and interpret that so that the management of risk and the formulation and progression of new approaches to service delivery can be constructed as an advanced practitioner. The consultant has a lot more highlighted areas. Ideally, and in my case, I am a doctoral level qualified person, a consultant should be working at doctoral level at the very least. You need to have your master's degree in place. And Health Education England have recently proposed that the consultants should also be able to demonstrate having a recognized teaching type of certification. It's usually a wide sphere of influence that the consultant works in. So it could be local, it could be regional, national, and even international. And it would be outside of your profession as well. So in other words, you're bridging between your specialist area and other professional groups. A consultant needs to show excellence in clinical leadership. It, the consultant needs to be a st strategist and think strategically. So it's outside the box kind of thinking beyond what the immediate job might suggest uh, a person may do. 
Quality improvement programs, system development, and helping others learn and develop are also roles of the consultant. And finally, performing research so you can contribute to knowledge creation. And that should be backed up by dissemination. So looking for publication, presentation at conferences, uh, posters, perhaps writing in textbooks, that kind of thing, and, and showing it in practice. So consultants should be able to manage high levels of complexity, uncertainty and unpredictability. In other words, you might not have all the information there to make a decision and you need to use critical thinking to enable you to do that problem solving. And think about new ways in doing things to start new programs and new ideas of service and working at a systems level. So what is advanced AHP practice? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with these kinds of diagrams um, whereby we see the four pillars of clinical practice, education, leadership, research and innovation. Everybody within the health service should be working within those four pillars of practice. It will be to varying degrees and varying levels according to what your job is. But as an advanced practitioner, that should be all done at master's degree level. So you're showing level seven working in an academic sense. When advanced practice is evident, you'll be operating in the four pillars, but you'll be managing that information. In other words, tying it all together to allow you to move forward and possibly acting as an advisor to other professional groups, perhaps the patients, and creating evidence to enable um, services to move forward and connecting those all together so that then you can act as a more informed advisor. So when all those pillars are linked together by those blue arrows, you are an advanced practitioner. Now the pillars may not stay the same. Um, the clinical practice area is the most uh, notable one and always stays the highest within the advanced practitioner uh, realm. It will change over time. The left side shows more working in leadership and education at a particular time that somebody may have looked at their practice. In the right hand group, you can see research and innovation is more important for that individual at that time of evaluation. Remembering that these things change over the working day or perhaps a week, and that might actually guide how you decide to develop yourself. Always remember though, this green clinical practice area is the one that is the strongest element for an advanced practitioner. We could describe it a different way. If we look at the three different areas that we just talked about as the specialist or senior, the advanced and the consultant, we can see that if we consider role specific clinical practice competencies, generic clinical practice competencies, and the three more generic areas of learning, leadership and evidence generation, you can see how the expectations of the different levels requires more involvement at different points of those competences. What's very important to note though is that the advanced practitioner will always have the top level of clinical uh, competences, be they uh, practice specific or more generic as is seen in the consultant. The differences you will then see is how much time have people or how much experience have people gained in perhaps learning, leadership and research. The advanced practitioner, as we can see up here, would be expected to have at least eight points within these and um, at least one in each area. So you've got some evidence of having experience in those other three pillars of practice. The consultant would be expected to have at least three in these other three areas, but we're expected to have a total of 12. So in reality, we could have a switch between fives and fours expectations of ability in the three other more generic areas of practice. We could describe it this way as well. If we look at the, go back to the uh, idea of the senior or the specialist practitioner, we talked about a specialist or a, ge a, a generalist kind of practitioner who has expanded their knowledge base. A specialist very obviously would sit in the much tighter, much taller area. And this is the um, place where you really learn quite an in-depth understanding of a very narrow field. 
the generalist by comparison will have a much broader understanding and possibly act in their work at a, a slightly higher level than the, the specialist would over certain areas. And you can see that overlap here. Uh, any radiographers out there that can remember Bremsstrahl and radiation and the little spikes that come on the characteristic curve of X-ray generation could actually see a generalist having areas of small interest, uh, small areas of interest at different points on that generalist curve as well, whereby they've maybe become involved in some other areas of activity. And that might be that individual developing their specialist role and thinking about moving forward towards um, de developing the move towards advanced practice status. The Greenaway model, which was developed by nursing colleagues, probably explains this really quite well in terms of somebody moving through their professional um, pathway. If we look right across to the left, we can see there's the pre-registration education or perhaps working as an assistant practitioner, moving across the top row then towards the consultant side of the spectrum. But in achieving that, we can see that people could have lots of different pathways, may have connections with uh, academia along the way, may have more connections with research, may be very clinically focused and rapidly move towards advanced practice, or consolidate their initial learning and then start to become, which is more traditional, a senior practitioner and then move on to advanced practitioner and then perhaps the consultant. Essentially, though, we can see how there's connections between all those different pathways and how they're interrelatable to enable people to move through their careers. Another important document that came out, I think it was 2014, was the transforming healthcare through clinical academic roles. And we can see here on the next diagram how the Greenaway model and the thoughts within um, the clinical academic perspective could fit together. And we see all the varying levels of different practitioner pay levels, levels of expectation in terms of um, education, types of things that they might be getting involved with in terms of their education along the bottom here, types of things they may be getting involved with in clinical along the top here, and how it all links together and can be a progressive development, but also can be something you can leapfrog certain uh, levels or points to move on to the next area, depending on how your professional development has moved forwards. Right, so we need to go back a, in time a little bit, and we need to look at how radiography and radiology came about. Until about 1925, the terms radiographer and radiologist were interchangeable. Uh, but eventually, the radiologist achieved the ability to provide demarcation between the two roles, which stayed the same for about 70 years, whereby radiologists were the interpreters of the images and radiographers were the producers. And, and to an extent, that's still fairly common now. But in 1971, um, Ken Swinburne, who was a radiologist that I actually worked with when I was a student, came up with the argument that radiographers weren't being used well enough for the knowledge base that they were developing and services needed further support. So this was the very first arguments for radiographer development in terms of could we have somebody that does more than what is normally expected of a radiographer? In other words, the early, early part of advanced practice. As time moved along and into the later period of the 1980s, we saw sonography taking a hold and ultrasound being what it is, or becoming what it is that we understand today. Breast screening being recommended in the early 90s, but mammography also being an area radiographers were developing in. Early interventional procedural changes that required further input from radiographers and CT and MRI impacting on service like it has. In the mid to late 90s, we see important documents that were politically supported, such as the Audit Commission's work in the mid 90s, the NHS plan later, and then in the 2000s, uh, well, the later 2000s, 2017, in fact, we see the, the development of the Advanced Clinical Practice Framework, which some of you I'm sure will be familiar with. So why was all this? Well, we needed to ask the question, can we cope within the NHS as we uh, were moving forward? And we could see some of the difficulties that we're experiencing nowadays actually developing. So we 
we asked the question, could we cope? And we recognised that we wouldn't be able to cope unless we fixed it by changing what we did. In other words, altering the professional boundaries and working across them together as a wider team. And if we wanted to do that, we had to think about ways in which we could develop advanced practice. And this is where the thing called the PDSA, so that's not the public uh, dispensary for sick animals, it's the plan, do, study, act cycle. So whereby we plan ideas, we look for an objective to achieve, we raise questions and carry out the cycle to see who, what, where and when might be involved in this. Once that's developed, we then take the plan forward, document any problems, start to analyze any data and study that so that we can compare the data that we've obtained with predictions we originally made and see if there's any learning to take from it. From that then, we need to act. Did we get it right? How can we move forward? What's coming next? Where do we go now? On top of that then, we need to evaluate what's happened. We've got to look at the return on the investment that's been put forward to see whether there's been significant impact on and is the need for that change that's been proposed really necessary. We then need to look at its application and what do allied health professionals need to do differently for this change to happen? And that might involve learning, it might need, need further research and developing skills and knowledge accordingly. So to enable that change, people have to be brought on to the next level. And then we have to understand how people have reacted to this and whether people will engage with it. And that comes at all levels. That could be the AHPs themselves. It could be people who originally performed the role. It could be people who are going to receive that input um, in a way that isn't traditionally the one that we would normally see, such as medical staff delivering these um, services. In Australia, back in 2014, and still to an extent now, the advanced radiographer practitioner role hasn't been introduced as significantly there as perhaps we're seeing in the UK. And the UK is still seen as the leading light uh, in development of radiographers in terms of advanced practice. But this diagram here shows all the interrelated problems or um, components that need to be put correctly in place to enable advanced practice to move forward and the um, understanding about who thinks what, where and when and how can we move it forward. And I think this is a really good model that you could go back and look at when uh, you're considering changing any, any practices yourself. So early days of radiographer advanced practice came through the reporting side in um, a need to meet the demand and timeframes required of the accident and emergency department for reporting. So if we use the PDSA idea, we ask a series of questions on the left of what do we do now, who does it, when, can or how do we improve and who will do that? So we can see any reporting with the people that did it, needed it, and the people that did it were the radiologists and their trainees, and that could result in significant delays. So to get over that, we needed to think about other staff to be involved, and the obvious people would that would be training radiographers within agreed scopes of activity. It may impact on the a &E perceptions. It could influence registrar training opportunities. And we also needed to use feedback methods and audit to be able to measure what we've done and how we've gone about it as being successful. So as we started to roll that out, we looked at which staff, and that had to be the people with experience and an interest in the area with a good aptitude for it and able to interact outside the normal ways of working that were accepted at that time. In other words, you're working in a new team now, so you have to be able to hold your own within that team. What training was required? Well, it needed to be postgraduate with mentoring in place. So we needed to have the radiologists involved. We needed to be understanding the technology that was in use. Uh, although rather amusingly, at the time when I did this, it was films bright lights for dark areas on the images and a magnifying glass to be able to see something a bit bigger. Um, and then other advanced practice skills that need to be brought to that. Again, all these have to fit within the social structure that this individual will be working in. And then we have to measure it. We have to measure it in an appropriate way, something that is not too onerous, otherwise you spend all your time measuring it. 
it should be recognizable in a multidisciplinary sense and we need to develop our research skills to enable us to uh, interpret what the information is giving us and how we might move forwards. So historically, if we think about the barriers to advanced practice, radiography has been prevented from wider development, despite showing that we have lots of evidence to support that this is a way that we should move forward. We also have to be sure about, is what we're proposing gonna be useful to the service? And will that service change be at a level equivalent to what was there before? In thinking about those things, is there the political will to support this? Usually the strongest voice wins out within advisory roles at government level. And so it means the obvious development group is superseded by a different profession. As well, will patients accept the different service? Because this is something that politicians are very wary of if patients decide that the service uh, isn't meeting the expectations. So what are the costs are there to manage this service? And are there people out there who are prepared to do it? So what are the expectations? First of all, what's in it for the service? Um, remembering, of course, you may label yourself as an advanced practitioner relative to what you would normally do, but for another group, that might not be an advanced practice. So we have to ask the question, do we need to develop this new person? Will this method meet the service demands? In other words, will it be as, at least as good as it was previously? How will patients react to having their work performed by somebody who isn't a medic and perhaps everybody expects a medical input? Can we continue to deliver this? Are there enough people there? Are they available at the right times of the day? And how do the staff need to change in their culture from their traditional roles to the new ones? And can this continue and can it extend into other areas? Clearly there need to be incentives and for a lot of people, it's the what's in it for me question, uh, particularly as well, how will I be educated? How, how am I going to have to stand a significant cost to enable me to do this role? Will there be a better grading for me once I start to operate at this level? And what level will I expect to uh, progress to uh, within various stages of my career? This change in Stafford may actually enable wider service delivery because with the new set of skill, knowledge, skills and behaviours people have, we could actually apply them to different areas. As a result of that, we might actually reduce some costs by perhaps reducing the external provision of reporting is one example, but also using a less expensive individual to do a job so that the other individuals who perhaps are more expensive can be focused on different roles that only they could do. The services would become timely. They will become values-based, which is a very important aspect nowadays of how we interact with our patients and carers and referrers to an extent. And this might actually happen outside of the hospital environment. It could happen in people's homes, particularly if you consider wider allied health professions. Um, essentially, we're gonna have an improved team. It's gonna operate in a more interprofessional way. If we just look back at the, the reporting radiographer, and, and, and before the reporting radiography really came on the scene, essentially a radiographer obtained the images. And even if they did notice something unusual on the image, it was just stack, stacked on a pile waiting for a report, the patient returns home, and then the radiologists may eventually work their way through a huge pile of reporting. At least 10 days later, in most cases, the report arrives via post to the GP saying the patient needs further tests and the CT has been arranged, then there's the wait for that report uh, and then a further examination is required to progress the patient's um, pathway and as you can see it's going to take a long time until somebody actually gets to the follow-up clinic appointment. So now with advanced practice moving away from the acquisition and just checking patient details radiographers today yes they still perform that range of um, activity but for some people that means they can report the examination if it's in their scope they can expedite the patient pathway when they find significant findings and effectively leapfrog some of those um, stages that we saw in the previous slide so reporting radiographers as my focus and particularly in Scotland as well, actually 
live in all the health boards around Scotland, except for some of the uh, more um, dispersed island communities. Essentially, an advanced practitioner will still acquire images, they'll report them, they'll speed up the pathways, they will inform referrers of urgent findings, they will provide education to other members of the team. Now that could be radiology trainees, other radiographers, people external to the team, and perform research and develop these new pathways. The big problem in Scotland, however, is that we're quite limited in the reporting field at the moment to be able to develop further, although there is work going ahead now to broaden that and wider potential could be achieved if we changed our attitudes towards uh, what we expect from a radiographer. So reporting radiographers would at least have to do a postgraduate certificate to enable them to report. That's a minimum of a year with advanced anatomy, physiology and pathology. Lots of practice audit within the course and then further audit after completing the course before um, autonomous practice is enabled usually within the health board. And then as the reporting radiographers add more areas to their scope of practice, they would perform more audit to show that they were working to speed. Usually people have been qualified at least three years in Scotland before they sign up for one of these programmes. Uh, and if the College of Radiographers follow their initial plans, and health education in England align with what the expectations will be, advanced practitioners will re need the full master's degree to get accreditation from the College of Radiographers. Consultants are expected to at least be working at doctoral level and aspiring towards completing a doctorate. Uh, and as I said earlier, if a, a health education in England uh, follow through, a consultant will be expected to demonstrate an ability to teach uh, with an appropriate certificate to show that. So why idea do the Scottish reporting radiographers cover? Well, generally plain trauma radiography is the, the starting point. Lots of English and Welsh reporting radiographers are involved in chest and abdomen as well. Uh, we're starting to see MRI reporting in Scotland, thankfully, but we see cross-sectional reporting happening more um, fully within England in particular. And I believe there is some work actually happening in Wales now. The Scottish experiences towards extending the musculoskeletal scopes of practice. Having said that, we've got to think about our other advanced practice colleagues. So the sonographers who report their images as soon as they're produced, the mammographers who are providing um, the triple screening or, um, series of examinations requires uh, mammographic reporting within their profile, along with biopsy taking and ultrasound. In the future, radiographers, by working as a team with the other AHPs, nurses and medics, will be able to assess, perhaps discharge patients, refer to others, change the examination, work in using multimodality approaches, so it's much more patient focused, or triage work to others to enable values-based delivery um, or enable faster reporting to happen because abnormalities have been spotted. Artificial intelligence could actually be a tool to change healthcare delivery. So radiographers and other healthcare professionals may use artificial intelligence to end up being a net beneficiary relative to radiologist numbers uh, as the artificial intelligence would support their activity. So I think the big message for radiographers, the idea of being a button pusher must change. It needs to be recognized by everybody out there that radiographers have got a huge amount more to contribute especially when you think 95 percent of patients come through the radiology department in some way or other for an imaging event which gives us access to lots of different types of patients with different types of requirements so look to control our demands at the moment isn't just about new staff and controlling the amount of imaging that happens. There's a need to align what a radiographer does to enhance service overall so that we can uh, improve the way the patient moves through the system. So previously, the barriers were changing the roles of the radiographer. So if we do that, we actually increase their value and that makes of us of much more interest to government bodies. The incentives are there to be attractive to people, so it attracts and retains the best people. So we build teams that can respond to the demands that are building. That may increase people's pay, 
and it will enhance services for the NHS that are effectively less expensive. The expectations will be, once these things become the norm, then this would be how radiographers would develop in the future. It would be their actual practice within normal service delivery. And professional development and patient demands are going to be achieved, and they will move further forward than we are at the moment. So artificial intelligence is argued to replace radiographer advanced practice by some people. However, I think artificial could, intelligence could augment clinical working. Um, because with AI, radiographers could safely diagnose, define treatment regimes, consider the prognostic value of those treatments and decide, is this the right way to move or do I need to refer to somebody else? Change the workflow pathways accordingly and speed up and expand the access to other AHP workers and nursing colleagues or other people um, across the health and social care sector. So if we embrace AI, the profession would be furthered and its identity could be changed. So the radiographer of the future would be multimodality capable, capable, provide initial clinical evaluations and perhaps work on a preventative approach by offering advice or referring people to services who could help patients avoid perhaps further trauma. Um, there could be strong professional links that enhance the, this public health approach, perhaps through um, smoking cessation for people who are about to start having um, radiotherapy treatment for cancers. So as a result of that, we can hopefully have a better uh, experience of the treatment. We might work more widely in the community, particularly radiotherapy advice, perhaps. And does this, this leads to a question, does it mean we have to change the pre-registration curriculum to some extent? And how does that fit with the College of Radiographers Education and Career Framework? Much of which we've seen definitions at the beginning. However, this is now up for um, review and hopefully will be coming through uh, by the end of this year. So we need to connect those things together. We need research and education at the center of clinical needs, role development, performance measurement and leadership. And we can see how each one of those joins together to enable advanced practice to move ahead. I think that's enough of me right now. I've, I've talked to quite a lot and quite quickly about a lot of ideas there. Uh, I'd be quite happy to take some questions uh, and uh, see if I can answer what, it, what it is burning in your minds at the moment. Thanks very much for listening to me. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to pop any questions you've got in the Q&A in the chat, I'll make sure um, to grill Jonathan now. And um, we've had a few already, Jonathan. So if I rattle through them in no particular order, um, what have we got here? Um, oh, well, somebody's asked, can they get the copy of the slide? So these, these recordings will be available on YouTube afterwards. So we will send uh, links to those out later. Um, how has COVID impacted the role of the radiographer? Any long-term changes? Um, we've learned quite a lot of things about how we work and how we organize ourselves, how things like a pandemic will shift what it is that we're doing uh, and how we need to focus on the aftermath of that. And this is, this is really important comp component to think about as we're moving into that recovery phase right now. Um, certainly big worries amongst government bodies are how do we respond to things like uh, delayed uh, diagnosis for cancer, for instance. But we've got to remember, cancer is the big one in people's minds, but there are a heck of a lot of other diseases out there that need responding to. So I see this as a great way in which radiographers can look at the way pathways work at the moment. They can look at themselves and ask, can we develop new advanced practices that would help the service respond to this, act, this um, demand? Um, people have had a lot of quite heavy experiences and emotional experiences, definitely. Um, and I think we, we have learned a lot in terms of uh, emotional intelligence as well, which I think could lead into those ideas of about the, the, the public health sort of thinking um, about the role of the radiographer and their interactions with the patients. Um, very interestingly, mammographers have started taking on counselling as part of their CPD because it may well be um, the patient that sees the mammographer for perhaps a symptomatic visit is the person that 
she or perhaps he pours out all those worries to. Um, so having those extra skills are, are part of the, the developments that we, we must be looking at across um, the, 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 the range of areas in which radiographers work. Fab. Um, one of the elements that is difficult to articulate is what is meant by working at master's level? <laughs> well, um, I think the best, best way to say that is looking at any definitions that you might see within a university module descriptor or perhaps a program descriptor would tell you what level seven is uh, in terms of master's level working and, and academic activity. Now that's about being um, critical and evaluative and not just taking things at face value and asking questions about what are we doing? Are we doing the right thing? Can we do this better? Am I doing the right thing? What do I need to do to enable me to do it well or to do it right and avoid any risk of uh, harm or injury to anybody that I may interact with in a, in a clinical sense? Um, so it's, it's getting those um, quite heavy duty verbs that you will see written in academic modules and, and documentation. Um, but I think your leadership group have a list of that kind of uh, information within their websites. Certainly when the new education, well, in fact, the current education and career framework for the College of Radiographers has that kind of uh, definitions within it. Um, as well, you would see that in any other professional bodies um, representation of their career frameworks. And it would indicate to you the kind of stuff that working at master's level would represent. Fab, thanks Jonathan. Um, can you foresee a time when people will train as generic healthcare workers and then specialise in a specific area of advanced practice? <laughs> oh, there's, there's a, a bomb waiting to go off, I think. <laughs> um, I think, I'm not sure whether it's a, necessarily a generic worker per se, but I do think that we need to consider as the wider non-medical professions to look at some of the material that perhaps the physician associates are including within their uh, initial education profiles and ask ourselves, do we need to include some of this to give us the springboard for later down people's careers um, to more easily take on what we now see as advanced practice as being more regular practice. So things like a better understanding of uh, physiology, pharma, pharmacology, that kind of things. Although I know radiography courses do have this to an extent within their programs, but not to the extent that perhaps a physician associate might do. Now that would give us a broader breadth. It would also perhaps give us greater acceptability by medical colleagues because we've had that grounding, which is very similar to the early days of a medical degree. Frequently, we have laid before us um, the accusation that you've not got a medical degree, therefore you can't do the same things. It would also answer uh, an interesting article that I think was 2004 or five, perhaps, that said advanced practice roles would always be task specific within radiography uh, and couldn't broaden themselves. So those kinds of ideas are the sort of things that might, um, um, I'm just looking at the comments that are coming up there, uh, are the sort of areas that people may need to include. Um, there are definitely much more, for want of a better word, soft science inclusions within programs now, certainly within radiography, um, to enable people to think about things in a different way and to act acknowledge the values that patients may have and their carers may have so that you can adapt to their needs better or offer advice about what might be the, the way in which to progress. Fab, another question for you. Radiation therapists in the UK seem to be taking on less technically focused AP roles. Do you see diagnostic radiographers moving towards similar pathways? I think we will have a mixture. I think we still need advanced practitioners that are very um, modality focused. However, in order to move some of the services forward, and this is more about how the health service decides to organize itself. Um, I think 
radiographers are likely to include more of this material, particularly, yes, I know Bronwyn, I remember you from Australia, <laughs> um, have particular issues in terms of we are often perceived in diagnostic radiography as a bit of a conveyor belt in terms of moving things forward, in terms of meeting the um, the waiting room demand rather than actually we need to have a more values-based approach. So um, a, a wider understanding, an ability to link in with the public health message. And this could be simple, simple things like uh, an idea that we've tried to get off the ground is for GP referred people post a fall, for instance, that actually haven't injured themselves, could be referred straight away to occupational therapy colleagues who are part of the falls and fragility team who would visit the patient in their home and offer um, equipment to help prevent those falls in the future. Um, or perhaps make an assessment that the patient might need some further different kinds of um, occupational therapy or physiotherapy or other wider uh, medically oriented input to enable the patient to 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 um, deal with their situation in life um, it's about meeting those activities of daily act living and doing it in a safe way so i think yes radiographers will need to have some of those skills in there I've got two questions from Martin. Um, how do you negotiate your relationship with radiologists in developing advanced practice? And what was the topic of your PhD, Jonathan? Well, my PhD was actually set in Australia, back to Bronwyn. Um, but my PhD was around, um, can radiographers interpret the images to an extent that they can provide a service similar to commenting? Um, but this was a measure against final year medical students because we felt that as is often the case a medical practitioner finishes their program and instantly they're into the deep water of having to interpret things themselves um, so if they had a further resource to ask about things that was more reliable um, then this would be a way to argue that radiographers in Australia could develop their advanced practices further. Um, so it gave the evidence to, to try and put, push that idea forwards. In terms of managing the um, relationship with the radiologists, sometimes it's challenging, I won't deny that. Uh, however, I think the way in which to approach this is to encourage the radiologist to participate in the generation of the development of the idea, uh, encourage the radiologist to contribute to the development and methods in which might be employed, ask them to get involved in the assessment process of the new idea to see how it moves forward. Um, it's quite interesting actually, it, since becoming a consultant myself eight years ago now, um, there has been a significant shift where it was over my dead body kind of thing and people snarled as I walked into the room almost um, to a proper acceptance that we actually can do this job and we do it well and we know our limits, which is another big thing in accepting that our education maybe hasn't been for as long or as in depth or maybe connects with some other aspects and that recognition that the radiologist um, is a member of the bigger team and is somebody to approach seems to be gaining um, positive reaction um, and we're seeing it work much better particularly in the smaller um, DGH kind of setups whereby a much more cohesive team can can work together and there is a move towards developing more communities of practice now, which is a mixture of people involved in that community. It's multi-professional, so it also extends outside of radiology so that there is um, a way in which everybody contributes and everybody is valued for what it is that they do. Um, so the, the team value is expressed. Um, a follow-up question there as well. Um, it seems that the Every Matter Counts engagement requires exploring by radiographers. I, I would agree, yeah. 
Um, we, I think we need to do that. I think what, where, where we've got a problem though is um, A, finding enough space within the, the team as um, pressure continues to rise in terms of the amount of imaging that's required of the radiology department continually growing insufficient staffing being in place. Now, uh, the Richards report should hopefully prove very positive for, um, uh, certainly for England, and I'm assuming that counts towards Wales and Northern Ireland. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but certainly we are trying to push for that kind of way of thinking within Scotland as well. Um, so if we had enough people in place, so that we can spread the load better and find that space in which to do that investigation. We can build on a thing here that we call realistic medicine, which is a combination of um, initial referrers working with the patient to make sure uh, that the referrer can respond to the patient's uh, questions, but also the right kind of ideas are expressed to the patient in terms of the requirements from services via that imaging or elsewhere. But also to make it clear to the patient where they are in this stage of their disease process and outline that, yes, we may be able to do certain things, but is that really what you want to do? So that every um, contact mattering then becomes part of everyday working for everybody. Uh, and we can then look at how we deliver our services and have that right kind of um, range of tools to respond to uh, any demands that the patient may lay before us in terms of their visit at that time. Thank you, a completely different question now. Um, uh, I've lost it, hang on. I got it. Can you expand on the impact um, and use of AI in the future? And do you see a resistance to the use of AI? Well, lots of radiologists aren't that happy about it because they, they have fears about it taking over their job and they don't feel that it's um, reliable because there's not enough testing happened at the moment. And most of the reports that are out there tend to be from manufacturers who obviously have a vested in interest. Um, some radiographers may not think that this is a good thing. Um, most radiographers really haven't had that big an opportunity to engage with AI, particularly at the moment. Um, we are doing some work to look at radiographer confidence in what the AI is telling them uh, as part of a PhD project um, to see if um, people change their minds about what it is the AI, if the AI is giving them certain information, does it change their minds about what they're seeing? So this is kind of a, a, a precursor then to radiographers being supported perhaps in commenting slash reporting immediately as the image is produced. Uh, with the backing of the AI, uh, which would then potentially change the pathway significantly that the patient follows. Um, so that we actually probably wouldn't have to have um, a, a definitive accident emergency reporting pile because it's being done immediately uh, by a range of people who aren't necessarily fully trained as reporters. AI has also got other roles to play. Uh, I think we need to remember that AI is there as a tool to help us be better at our exposures that we use, better at connecting the dots in terms of uh, what we can do for the patient, how we can plan their treatment, how we can plan their appointments, make it possible things to happen in a much more joined up fashion so that things can take place at least quickly, if not altogether in one visit. Uh, and this is where AI can have much more use than just the perception that it's going to take somebody's job. Thank you. Um, the next two questions, I'm going to sort of put them together. We may want to bring in Charlotte Martin or Howell from um, our School of Healthcare Sciences. Would the MSc include leadership skills that you discussed earlier? And could there, is there an opportunity to do a PG cert or a DIP in um, this topic? So I may... Yeah. Charlotte, well, how you may want to jump in as well here. From, from my experience, there are a mixture of things out there. Um, 
certain universities are going down the line of trying to build these aspects into individual modules, no matter what module they are. Some universities are focusing quite heavily with a particularly focused module in some of those areas that you talk about. Um, some universities will offer a full qualification in an area, um, or it may be, depending on what your advanced practice is, you would tie those sort of things together. So it could be, you see, a, a consultant or an advanced practitioner doesn't necessarily have to just be clinical. You could be advanced in what you're doing in another kind of way, perhaps as a, a manager or perhaps as a researcher uh, within the, the sort of clinical setting. Um, so these kinds of areas then are aspects that the individual needs to have in place to enable them to think of the right questions to ask and the right ways to consider uh, service development uh, and, and look at how that can be joined together, perhaps working in either as a clinical advanced practitioner or as a person who would um, organize the services within within a system. Uh, I don't know whether the guys in, in the team would, would agree with that. Hi, Jonathan. Just want to say thank you very much for your presentation. It's, it's really interesting. And uh, actually, a lot of what you commented on, a few of our students over the last few years have actually had to write assignments on the very topic. So uh, it was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I mean, um, at Cardiff, in terms of the MSc in radiography, um, most UK students that apply to do the MSc go down the route of reporting. So they will take up the modules that are the reporting modules. Um, some of our overseas students that don't have the opportunity then to go home and practice reporting will study image appreciation and alongside that they often pick up a module that is run by uh, our nursing colleagues which centres around uh, management and leadership so that there is that that option within the um, the programme at Cardiff so yeah we, we do have that but I agree with you Jonathan I think the way forward for radiography is that actually leadership and management in a sense should be a core element of the undergraduate or postgraduate and run through all modules really because um, it's very difficult to pick out leadership and management uh, as, a, as an individual subject it runs through everything we do as, as, as clinical professionals so I think that's a really good point to note that uh, in terms of developing undergraduate courses that leadership and management becomes far far more um, core to the to the subjects. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, uh, definitely, Martin. I, I would agree wholly with what you say there. And I think the other area that people are talking about significantly at the moment is entrepreneurialism, which is a different kind of way of looking at the health service. If we look at it in a more it's not a term I really like, but it's it's essentially taken in a more business like way. Um, so that encourages people to join disparate information up into something that's cogent that can then make a big impact on the way services are delivered uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're making money or always saving money but it's about um, making it evident that um, we can do things better if we did it in a slightly different way uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, for a really comprehensive presentation and a really comprehensive Q&A at the end. I think we've covered quite a few topics in, in that Q&A. You've answered them all really comprehensively. So thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you to the to everybody who joined us this afternoon. I hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you to the, the team at um, the School of Healthcare for helping us put this on. And a massive thank you to you, Jonathan, for your presentation this afternoon. No problem. It's been a pleasure. And uh... If you need anything in the future. <laughs> you may regret that. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Take Cheerio. care.